Thank you everybody for coming today for this panel discussion, No Ban, No Wall, Confronting the Militarization of Our Borders and Communities. So this panel is happening at a time where we continue to hear terrifying news about potential and real ice raids and threats to immigrant communities in the Bay Area and beyond. These threats have of course been very real for our university's immigrant and undocumented student and staff, and we're not taking them lightly. The leadership in this country has increased attacks on immigrant and marginalized communities by targeting sanctuary cities, instituting the Muslim ban, and revoking temporary protected status for thousands of people. But we know that such actions are based on long-standing xenophobia and criminalization. Such repression manifests not only at borders, but also in our backyards, in the form of militarized policing, state surveillance, and collusion between local and federal law enforcement. We feel honored to be hosting this panel discussion to analyze these intersections with some of the individuals working to defend the health and rights of the Bay Area's immigrant communities and communities of color. And today I'd also like to thank the Borders and Bodies Collective from UC Berkeley for being part of this event. The Borders and Bodies Collective is a student-led project that aims to raise consciousness around immigration and health. Tonight's event is part of a broader series of monthly panels entitled Social Medicine for Our Times, a series of public talks on health and social justice that's organized jointly by the California Nurses Association and National Nurses United and by the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine. This current moment requires health practitioners, scholars, and activists to think and strategize in novel, structurally competent, and audacious ways. National Nurses United, which has been at the forefront of the battle to win universal health care, and the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine, bringing together scholars and students interested in these issues on campus, invite you to this series of public talks that are meant to bring together scholars, practitioners, organizers, and activists addressing critical current events related to social and health justice. So please join us at our monthly events. You can check out the website at bcsm berkeley.edu or the California Nurses Association Facebook page. Please silence your cell phones. Yeah, so today we'd like to introduce the wonderful panel that's here with us today. First of all is Professor Ophelia Ortiz Cueva. Uh, professor Cueva is an assistant professor in the Department of Chicano and Chicana Studies at UC Davis. Her work focuses on race, policing, uh, and prisons with a focus on the history of capital and racial violence. Her current work looks at Los Angeles County Jail and the management of LA's black and brown population. She is also the faculty advisor to a new student organization called Beyond the Steps, which is a group of formerly incarcerated and system impacted students who have come together to find ways to support each other and cultivate um, a prison to school pathway that offers formerly incarcerated and system impacted individuals access and assistance in seeking higher education. Yes, and my name is Gladys Chavez and I am a, a student at the School of Health. Hi, I'm Sophia. I'm also a student at the School of Public Health and a member of the Borders and Bodies Collective, introduced earlier by Zach. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing Laura Kiswani. Um, Laura is a Palestinian born in the Bay Area. She's worked with, as a youth and adult educator. Is currently a member of Al Jazeera, uh, of the Arab Shatat, a local Palestinian folklore dance troupe. Is a lecturer at San Francisco State University in the College of Ethnic Studies and the executive director of the Arab Resource and Organizing Center, the AROC. The AROC is a local grassroots organization that builds power in the Arab and Muslim community. We organize against war, repression, Zionism, and militarism through campaigns such as Stop Urban Shield, seeking to put an end to the largest SWAT training and weapons expo from happening in the Bay Area each year. Um, my name is Lucy. I'm also a uh, uh, master's student at the School of Public Health. Uh, Pierre Lavoisier is a founding member of the Haiti Action Committee. He was born in Haiti and has been active in the struggle for justice since his teen years. The Haiti Action Committee, based in the Bay Area, is a network of activists who have supported the Haitian struggle for democracy since 1991. 
Members foster extensive contacts with the grassroots movement in Haiti and work to promote international solidarity. He currently serves as a board member for the Global Exchange, the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund, and the Ecumenical Peace oh, Institute. Good. Hi everybody, my name is Joanna. I'm also a student here at the School of Public Health. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Abraham Vela, who is a, a volunteer at the Clinica Martin Baró in San Francisco. Abraham Vela grew up between the Bay Area and Guatemala. At the age of 18, he began to work alongside a passionate group of people at the San Francisco State University to open a student-run clinic in San Francisco's Mission District called Clinica Martin Baró, named after Ignacio Martin Baró, a Salvadoran social psychologist, founder of Liberation Psychology, and one of the Jesuit priests who was murdered um, by the Salvadoran military during the country's civil war. Ten years later, this clinic continues to provide free health services with a culturally competent and humanistic approach to medicine. Through the clinic, Abraham worked alongside Professor um, Felix Curry at SF State to inform him about the Latin American School of Medicine in Cuba, which trains students from the most vulnerable communities in the world on the condition that they return to serve their home. He started his medical education in Cuba in 2010, graduating in 2016 as a physician of science and consciousness, uh, never losing track of the commitment he made to the Cuban people and his community. He is now in the process of applying to residency in the U.S. So I should have said that I am Seth Holmes. I'm on faculty here at Berkeley in Medical Anthropology and Society and Environment. And the plan for the panel today is to go in this order with presentations from each of them, um, followed by a conversation with you, question and answer, et cetera. So thank you for coming. Okay, um, so folks can hear me in the back. Is that good? Okay. Um, well, I am um, going to, I guess, start things off. Um, and I just want to let folks know, like, my work isn't specifically on immigration. It is on police and policing domestically here in the United States. Um, but it is also kind of a theoretical, historical look at policing um, around the globe. Uh, I look at policing in Ireland, in Africa, in places in Asia. Um, because through my work, I have found that, again, even though I write about domestic uh, policing here in the United States, that this has been, that this is actually a global problem, which we're all going to kind of get into. Um, it's a problem about the ideas of security, about sovereignty. Um, and it is really a problem, and I'm going to throw this out there provocatively, but it's a problem of race and racism. I'm just going to say simple, because they told me I had 10 minutes, so I'm going to try to put together two academic talks and an anecdote with a personal story, all in 10 minutes. So I'm just going to cut straight to the chase. This is a problem of racism. Okay, and what I mean by that on a global scale, because I'm going to talk about this, when I'm talking about this, and even though I'm going to talk about LA, and I'm going to talk about California, um, I mean this globally. Uh, I mean this in relationship to the idea of racial capitalism, um, the structures of capitalism which cannot work without race and racism, um, the structures of colonialism, of imperialism, policing, I believe, is a part of it. Um, and so again, even though it might seem like it's a local problem or it's a problem in, in terms of like the post-Trump administration um, or it's a problem only in relationship to immigration, um, it is not. It's a larger, longer problem. Policing has always been a part of the way that we understand, I believe, the modern world. Um, so, uh, I, um, and I'm trying to explain this to an incoming class of undergraduates right now. I teach a class of an intro course in Chicano Studies that's about 453 students. Um, and I'm trying to talk to them about law and racism, even though, again, it's a, just an introduction to who Chicanos are in, this, in the United States. And, and we start off talking about the relationship between law and capitalism and how law in and of itself has this kind of inherent component of violence in it, right? I think my students come in and they believe law to be something that provides stability, um, order against things like chaos and disruption and um, lack of safety and security. Um, and so when I begin this kind of conversation and talk about how law is related to capitalism and hence the colonial project, you know, they have, a, they have difficulties in understanding that law isn't 
on our side, that law isn't a good thing. And many of those students are actually looking towards law to help protect them. Laws like, you know, to change immigration laws and have them kind of facilitate, you know, their, their citizenship as if citizenship could protect them. And again, it's not that citizenship cannot, but when it gets to the point in which police violence is enacted in the project of capitalism, or racial capitalism in particular, I believe there to be no protection. Um, I believe the walls that we're talking about, although they are physical, the wall between U.S. and Mexico, the wall between Palestine and Israel, um, the many walls historically that have been developed, the physical structures, as we know, are not the problem because we can come and go and cross back and forth, right? And we can gain citizenship or not have citizenship, but as racial subjects, as racially defined human beings that come out of like everything that existed, again, before the Trump administration, um, is what makes us subject to the violences that we see happening in those very spots, like the very kind of spots that we're already, whether it is, which I'm going to talk about today, LA County Jail or Immigration Detention Centers. It's the point of that violence um, in which we can't, any of us, or some of us, Many of us, some of us, or at least those of us concerned here, cannot be safe. Um, and I was reading earlier, again, to kind of throw out to my class, like, how do I explain this to them? How do I explain that law is not necessarily going to fix the matter of violence for them, right? Those that are concerned about the violence of inequality or police violence, or et cetera. And, um, you know, I went back to, again, a very kind of a, uh, uh, Maybe it's famous or not. As an academic, he was kind of a very famous essay by Walter Benjamin, um, where he talks about violence. And he very early on says, and this is long before the prison industrial complex, what we now know of police brutality that exists every single day, the issues of immigration that we have um, here in the United States and around the globe. And he said that the tradition of the oppressed teaches us that the state of emergency in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. But it is the rule. It is always, it is always existed, right? Walter Benjamin not talking about contemporary United States, but talking about what he was looking at at that point. Um, and he says this sometime after, and again, looking at police, I kind of pulled through, like, who is it and who was saying what about policing early on? Again, long before we are kind of dealing with policing at the present moment, or the issues of police we're dealing with at the present moment. Um, and I also found, you know, a quote by Marx where he says, security, which I believe this is a moment that we're living in. I mean, is police is the form in which security manifests itself, right? Policing is on the ground action of law. It is law in action, right? Because this law always requires violence. It's inherent in it. Otherwise, it wouldn't work, right? Locke said it. I'm not even saying it. Now, these guys way before me said all these guys talking about law and the violence of it explicitly, openly. They weren't so liberal the way we are now. We had to kind of hide it and make it all look like a good thing. Um, um, and Mark said that security is the supreme concept, concept of civil society, the concept of the police. He knew early on that it was on the ground in which capitalism and the violences of capitalism are protected. And he wasn't talking about colonialism per se and race, but we are. And we will. Sorry, I all of us. And so. I'm just going to kind of throw that out there to kind of let you know where I'm coming from and my approach to policing as it is global, even though right now I'm going to give you a short story and a little antidote and try to squeeze in a paper in five minutes. Do I have five minutes left, Carlos? Yes. All right, cool. Uh, and I'm a little nervous because I feel like I'm actually kind of doing the exam right now. I I do this right. Um, I wrote a paper a while ago when I was asked to talk about black and brown relations um, in, at, in Los Angeles. Somebody called me and said, hey, will you write about black brown relations in LA? And I was like, really? Oh, I hate that. Like, I, I, I don't like this kind of way in which there's this sociological view of the differences between black and brown, right? I do policing, I do violence, I do racial violence. And so I finally said yes to this, and I didn't know how to start it, but I began with a story that happened while I was writing this paper. And I had a friend, a very, very close friend of mine, who had already done time in places like Pelican Bay State Prison, um, San Quentin, Adelanto State Prison, Soledad. He called me from LA County Jail because he's been policed once again as a brown young man in California. And he was being held in LA County Jail. 
And he said, oh my God, he goes, you've got to do something, you've got to call somebody, you have to, you've got to get me out of here. I had never, in the 15 years that I'd known this person to be locked up in some of the most kind of intense state facilities in this, that California has, to sound so scared and nervous. And he ended up hanging up the phone. I couldn't find him for three days because jail is, and I take this on in my studies, I, I kind of make an argument that jail is very different from prisons. I'm, I'm kind of advocating for a jail studies program to his. Because jail is really, again, about policing, and I think it relates to many of the things we're going to be talking about today. To, jail is kind of like the pre-administration of justice. It's the moment when you are hailed by the police officer in the officerian sense and put into what I will call a detention center, LA County Jail. I know some people do simply why no time and spend an hour in there, although now some people can spend up to 24 months, but the difference is between jail and prisons is that jail is a pre-trial detention. In jail, in county jails across this state, you have not necessarily been tried and convicted as a criminal. You are being held. So you are not necessarily guilty of your crime, and yet jails the physical kind of containment of jails and the way that the body exists in there is very much, I believe, exists under the rubric of punishment, of bodily disintegration. Um, it has six times higher death in custody rate than state prisons do, right? It is because it's a lost space. It is the force of law between the police and jail, right? It is still a function, I believe, of policing. Um, and when he called me, what had happened was that he had spent <coughs> in between being uh, going to trial in Long Beach and being held up near Magic Mountain at, at Wayside Detention Facility, which is part of Ellicott County Jail. Um, he spent three days in a four-man cell, and they had put in three days 17, he thinks 17 black and brown men, varying in age and And that's when he called me midway through. So 17 people in a four-man cell, that's like they couldn't, they couldn't sit, they couldn't lay, they could barely go to the bathroom. And people would have thought at that point, well, they're going to kill each other because there's this kind of idea that black and brown folks are going to, you know. Them. And he calls me four days later. He finally made it up to Wayside, and he goes, and I said, well, what happened? And he explained it to me. And then I said, is it scary? Because here I am writing this paper that this university asked me to write about black and brown relations. Is there a difference? And he goes, no, because at some point we knew the fucking jail was going to kill us all. But it was the jail that was going to be the death of us. Um, and so. I started kind of writing from that point and thinking about, again, and this has to do with security, right? The security in which Los Angeles feels it's so necessary, the protection of a population that has been kind of deemed as the population of Los Angeles has on several occasions made when global cities are being measured by Foreign Policy Magazine, which does this big kind of annual measurement of cities. Los Angeles is deemed as like the sixth most important city with human capital being its most valuable resource. No other cities, Hong Kong, London, New York, et cetera, et cetera, they don't, they have ports, they have different kinds. Human capital is LA's most valuable resource, which means the kind of incorporation of their population to kind of make it a very productive city. And yet it has the largest local jail on the planet. So how do those two things go together? What does that mean when this person calls me up and said this jail was going to kill me, was going to kill us, both black and brown people? Um, and I wondered, well, how does that how does that happen? How do these people get disappeared? How do they turn into like nobody keeps track of them? This is a four man cell. This is a bureaucracy. This they, people are counted, right? They're supposed to be counted. Where's my brother? I'm a citizen. He's a citizen. Where is he? Where is his rights? Right? They are disappeared. They are disappeared into that cell. In a, in a paper that I talk about, they disappear in this kind of violent arithmetic of the state because the state doing this kind of way in which it protects itself that. At the point of violence, at least for the racial subject, the colonial racial subject, the imperial racial subject, disappears into one thing. Um, so that's when it became clear to me that jail was a different type of imprisonment. And I do collapse jail and policing as separate from prison, as separate from trial administration of justice over here on this side. So my friend was no longer a countable entity. He wasn't an individual. He wasn't a person. So, so one black and brown body after another that were forced into this cell, which far exceeded the number of individuals that it was meant to do, meant that the jail and its managing structures had lost count of the number of human beings, or maybe they weren't human beings anymore. Or maybe they were not considered human beings, but they were one collapsible entity, right? Um, and so that maybe that this accounting had come to mean something different. 
what I have come to call in most of my work the violent arithmetic of the state, where this county jail is the zeroing point, and I believe this exists across the globe, the zeroing point on this kind of cryptography of what, what is human terrain, as I kind of take this on as a little bit of a geographer and a little bit of a bunch of other kind of different things that I do. Um, um, so this cartography of human terrain, where it kind of zeroes out the black and brown population and the management of these populations, that is to ensure the human capital of the state of Los Angeles, or the city of Los Angeles, or maybe a state, considering how much money it holds on to. Um, and so those conditions of violence are <coughs> suffered in jail, right, which there is only, there's very little work on the idea of jail versus prison. There's the, um, and the scholar passed away, John Irwin, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the scholar the name of John Irwin, right, he wrote about San Francisco County Jail about 30 years ago. It's one of the few works on jail versus prison um, that exists. And he talked about jail being the cruelest form of punishment in the United States with its primary purpose to be the management of rabble, like rabble management. Um, and then he explains that those held in jail are, are arrested more because they are offensive to society, although I think 30 years later he might say, say something else in terms of the value of proper, the property in San Francisco, right? Um, that they are offensive to society because they've, um, versus because they've committed crime, that they are persons deemed not well integrated in conventional society or social networks, disreputable because they are perceived as irksome, offensive, threatening, capable of arousal, and even proto-revolutionary. They are disruptors of social and economic stability on any given geographical space. Again, I think 30 years later, 35 years later, the property value of what San Francisco is and what it means, I think, heightens that idea of the value of that space and even the violence in and of itself. Um, and so, how am I doing, Carlos? Okay. One minute, two minutes, give me two. Um, so jail, and again, I talk about jail as this zeroing point, um, but it is about policing, it is about security, it's about the moment of disappearance that like kind of blows up the idea of the violence experienced by racial and colonial imperial subjects across the globe. I think that jail does this. Um, and so, okay, I'm just gonna skip down to this. Um, it, that I think it's through this violence that we can observe jail and policing. And all police are the same to me. Police, soldiers, checkpoints, ICE, Homeland Security, it's all cops, it's all police. I observe jail as a technology of war that looks much like the violence of colonialism, that the jail itself is post, as a post-colony, almost. Um, and I kind of refer to this work by Sheila Mbembe, a South African political science and philosopher who describes the post-colony as that violent space where there are some that are placed in a sort of non-space, who do not know if they are alive or condemned, where 15 become one or actually none. Um, and so again, that is just to say, all right, I'm done. <laughs> um, the policing, the building of the largest security apparatus in this world that happens here in the United States and then has its tentacles, as we all know, and I'm sure we're going to talk about the police um, kind of consulting with Bratton from Los Angeles in Mexico City, right? How do we develop a better police in Bratton's consultations in Tel Aviv, et cetera, et cetera. We all kind of understand that global reach but it's policing itself in the spaces of detention, that kind of moment, the pre-administration of justice that I believe happens, which means I don't necessarily know how to get out of this. Kind of embedded in the global history of colonialism, the ideas of sovereignty, the spaces of the states of exception, that always land on the back of the racial subject. And that's it, all right, I'm done. moment, although obviously all of us would agree, none of this is new, um, only under Trump, but the stakes are higher and the impact is quite much deeper and different than we have seen in many years. And it can seem impossible to know how to tackle these issues that seem impossible to challenge. And so I think while it's, um, especially when we understand, and I like that they used, Pierre was commenting on the flyer for the event tonight, the No Ban, No Wall, Sanctuary for All flyer which was created by Design Action Collective and used at the SFO airport shutdown last year. How many of you guys were there 
when we shut down the airport to support the families that were detained and won and freed them, right? Um, so we want to remind ourselves that there are also wins and we have the capacity and potential to challenge militarization, to challenge borders, to challenge policing, and actually free people in, in very tangible ways. Um, and we understood when we shut down SFO that the no ban, no wall sanctuary for all was really about tackling forced migration. Um, the ways in which people are forced to come here because of militarization, because of imperialism, because of racism, and understanding that at the crux of it all, and then criminalizing those same people that are forced to be here and telling them they have no place to go, and literally putting them in prisons, right? Um, luckily for us, there are ways to actually take on tangible campaigns and efforts to challenge militarization, to challenge policing. And one um, example that happens right here in your own backyard is Urban Shields. So how many of you guys have heard of Urban Shield um, before today? Before you heard the bio? Okay, good. Um, so Urban Shield is the largest SWAT training, war, war games training in the world, and it happens right here in the San Francisco Bay Area every single year since 2007. Um, and that, I say it's the largest because it is the largest, but also because I want people to understand the gravity of this weapons expo and this war games training, the fact that it brings repressive regimes and police agencies from across the world, including Bahrain, Mexico, the state of Israel, to come train local law enforcement, but also to come train emergency um, prepared emerg EMTs, nurses, doctors, um, firefighters, so on and so forth. Urban Shield is literally 48 consecutive hours of war games training that happens every single year in the Bay Area. Some of the training happen right here in Berkeley, some happen in Oakland, some happen in San Francisco, some happen in San Leandro. Pretty much almost every single city in the county participates. Alameda County is the host of this training. The Sheriff Ahern, um, Sheriff Ahern, if any of you guys aren't familiar with him, should be familiar with him given his very close relationship to Sessions, to the Trump administration, and his commitment to continuing to bolster ICE and police right here in the Bay Area. So that's sort of the context in which Urban Shield takes place every single year right here and trains people from across the world um, and within the Bay Area. And it's a racist training, so we understand it point blank, it's a racist training. When asked about why it is that he brings Mexican police to train local police officers, Ahern literally said it's because I want to understand how to deal with Mexicans in the Bay Area. So that's one way to understand what it is and what it's about. Um, also examples of how it actually plays out in terms of the trainings themselves. We've gone to the Weapons Expo, we've been observers, um, we've actually seen the trainings ourselves. And what you see at these trainings and at the Weapons Expo are people that look like my people, Arab people, wearing kafiyas, who are the enemies to be targeted, to be controlled, to be shot, um, and to be protected from, right? So when they build this as an emergency preparedness training, which is the other really important component to what Urban Shield is about, when they build this as a training to actually deal with disasters in the Bay Area, to deal with emergencies that could come up at any point in time, to make sure that EMTs are prepared for whatever way they come in, um, and they do that by training people that the enemy is the Arab or Muslim terrorist, or in many other cases, the activist, where they use scenarios of demonstrations and how to quell protests. Or in other cases, Black Lives Matter demonstrations or Occupy protests. So these are the types of enemies that they're training EMTs and nurses to protect people from, right? That's Urban Shield. And when we're talking about um, you know, no ban, no wall, when we're talking about the health and well-being of communities, it's important to also contextualize these types of activities that happen on a regular basis. In fact, you know, um, for example, Urban Shield takes place on the weekend of 9-11 every single year. It takes place on the weekend of 9-11 every single year for a good reason, right? What does that invoke? And what does that invoke for cops and police and for law enforcement? But what does it invoke for immigrants, for Arabs, for Muslims, for black and brown communities have, who have now been further criminalized because of the war on terror, right? So they do this every single year and they do this unchallenged by the counties, by law enforcement, and by different cities. But there's been a lot of resistance to Urban Shield, too. Um, and I want us to also remind ourselves that Urban Shield took place in Oakland. That was the host for the Weapons Expo um, since 2007. And then in 2014, after growing resistance, um, we mobilized and did a lot of organizing in order to make it 
pretty much impossible and unacceptable for, our, for many of our own cities, I live in Oakland, to host um, this weapons expo. And we were successful. So we got it out of Oakland, which was a great win. When we became aware of Urban Shield, it was a pretty easy sell to folks to let them know about this horrendous training that's obviously racist. Um, that's the most you know, popular shirt sold there was Black Rifles Matter, for instance. Um, and to challenge it because the Bay Area hosts it and brings people from across the world to further criminalize and tra train people how to further repress and use tactics and, and technologies that are used against our people all across the world, right? So understanding it as a global phenomenon. But being able to tackle something so tangible. So it happens right here. If we were to end Urban Shield, we literally could have an impact on global policing. We, really, we literally could have an impact on the health and well-being of our people, and the resources, the $5 million that go to Urban Shield every single year, could be diverted to real emergency training, preparedness training, to real um, preparedness for the community to be able to respond to disasters that we know we're seeing all across the world that we're not prepared for. Um, and so when we fought to get it out of Oakland, we won, because it was an easy sell. But guess where they moved it to next? Pleasanton. <laughs> so they took it to a place where they thought we couldn't organize and mobilize, a place that would be much more difficult to create resistance and awareness around. I think that wasn't true. We showed we showed up that next year, brought hundreds of people at 8 and a.m. We actually shut down the entire of Expo and we had to they had to cancel a training because of our ability to organize and show resistance to Urban Shield in the middle of Pleasanton. So, <laughs> It's not a matter of there's not enough resistance, but we haven't done enough to push decision makers um, to be able to hold themselves accountable to the power they have to actually make a difference. So where we're at with Urban Shield is the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco, the Board of Supervisors in, in Alameda County, different city council members, everyone points the finger at everybody else. So yeah, this is really bad. We don't want to militarize police. It's not a good look, but we need the money. Or yeah, but we, and it's not in our hands. We just need the money, but we can't really end Urban Shield. Well, San Francisco is the fiscal agent as a county. Alameda County is the one who hosts it and actually uses the money to create and make Urban Shield happen every single year. So there's somebody who has a decision-making power in this little formula, and we know that. And so our, our work now is to put pressure on Alameda County Board of Supervisors to put an end to Urban Shield once and for all. We haven't been against Urban Shield just since Trump got elected, but the fact that they allow someone as close to Sessions to spearhead and mastermind of such a racist and xenophobic training that actually trains health professionals and public health workers every single year to treat us as enemy combatants and get away with it every single year is unacceptable. So a call we have for you as a Stop Urban Shield Coalition is to learn more about this campaign and as public health professionals to reach out to Board of Supervisors, to your city council members, to any decision maker or public official that you have a connection to or is accountable to you, let them know that you too believe that it's unacceptable for militarization to be prioritized over people's health. Thank you. This is a lot of great work that's going on in the Bay Area. So thank you all. Um, Pierre Labossier, and I'm a member of the Haiti Action Committee. And I'm also a member, I forgot to add that, a member of East Bay Sanctuary, uh, East Bay Sanctuary Covenant. And I'm a member of the Haiti Sanctuary Committee of East Bay Sanctuary Covenant. So I love this flyer, No Ben, No Wall, Sanctuary for All. Because it says it, it's pretty powerful. And um, this is the rallying cry in terms of solidarity with each other, with people of the world who are faced with conditions of oppression that are forcing us to flee to leave our homeland for many people. Um, and I will be focusing on Haiti. I'm from there. But my remarks about Haiti are very similar to what could, is happening in different parts of the world. And so the idea of and I want to mention the temporary protected status. Because right. it's a major thing, and this is what that triggered the racist comments by President Trump when he said, um, well, when he said the comments that everybody knows what he said, <laughs> those longer comments. And, uh, and clearly pointing out the racial nature of it when he mentioned, when he made a comparison with Norway, we should get people from Norway. So um, very clearly saying we want white people to become black people and people of color. 
So, and, and uh, what struck me is that the public outrage was phenomenal. Not discounting the few or the many who supported him, but the outrage was just fantastic. And it's showing that people of the world really are very decent. People reject this kind of racism <coughs> and xenophobia. And people, what we need is to learn more about each other and to work more closely in solidarity. The thing about TPS is that many times the issue, and let me focus on Haiti here a bit, all immigrants generally are dehumanized. They dehumanize us. And so it makes it easier to put us in the jails, to forget about us, or to brutalize us, to break up our families, because once you do that, you dehumanize someone, then it's easier. You don't see a human being there. And you can get away with brutalizing them, denying them their rights. Many people are very familiar with political asylum. It's very sacred. I want to put TBS within that category and expand on it. Basically, what you have is protected status. It's the right of human beings to seek refuge. This is a fundamental right. It's the same right as, the, as freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. And people have the right to pursue happiness, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And so temporary protected status, in the case of Haiti, this is from a law in 1990. And it guarantees people from lands where there are conflicts, where people are uh, all because of natural disasters. If people are in a situation in another country, then that person cannot be forced back into a situation where their lives would be in danger. Political asylum deals with more like the individual who's being repressed politically because of their political beliefs, and though that has been expanded quite a bit. But I feel that temporary protected status is misunderstood and when they speak about it. And one of the things that we, with the Haiti Action Committee, are trying to push um, is to, to make sure that the political situation, the situation of the country, not just the natural disasters that have, that have happened in Haiti, such as the earthquake and the, um, the, the hurricanes that have devastated Haiti, um, but also the country conditions, the man-made disasters. We have two coup d'etats, 1991 and 2004. These were brutal coup d'etats by the right wing in Haiti, supported by the US, actually led by the US. The second coup d'etat was led by the US, France, and Canada. As people in Haiti were trying to rebuild the country, these coup d'etats devastated everything that was built. One of the examples is the infrastructure. And I'm connecting this with the earthquake. Many hospitals, the government of President Harris, democratically elected government by the people of Haiti, that government was taken out and everything it had built was pretty much destroyed. And so the U.S. led uh, an occupation using the United Nations as a figure. And that occupation, which has now lasted for 14 years, has systematically destroyed the economic conditions in Haiti, forcing people to be in situations where before they, it's worse than ever before. And so to look at Haiti and to claim that, well, you know, as Trump said, we are going to be sending people back to Haiti. Well, you are sending them back to what? To conditions where even in the hospitals, for example, the public hospital in Port-au-Prince, you have to pay before they touch you. You have to pay for bandages. They hand you a prescription. Well, the, doc the gloves that the doctor uses, the bandages, the syringe to give you a shot, all of that is part of the prescription. Unless you have it, they won't touch you. Money is poured into hate. A lot of those money stolen by the NGOs, monies that should have gone to build 
the infrastructure of the country that was devastated by the earthquake and by the man-made disasters, completely destroyed. We have, there has been a lot of investment by the US, France, Canada, and others <coughs> into creating a police force. That police force is created in the image of United Nations forces that have been conducting massacres in Haiti. And recently, not only massacres, but rape, prostitution of children, raping of children. I cannot say prostitution, because how is a child going to be a prostitute? You know? It's systematic rape. And using monies that people had raised and donated in the aftermath of these natural disasters to help rebuild the country, using those monies to really um, create a state of terror among the local population. There are many ways you can conduct a genocide. You can conduct it by dropping a bomb or killing everybody. But you can conduct it also by starving the population. United Nations troops came and, excuse the term, defecated in the main river in, in the Atibonit Valley, creating a huge um, mess of cholera. And the United Nations have the resources, the expertise, the funds to stop it from spreading all over the country. They didn't do that. They were spending money trying to contain the, the, the trying to do what you call it, damage control, and saying they have nothing to do with this. And to this day, the infrastructure is worse. And finally, I want to say that uh, we've seen all kinds of NGOs. Haiti is the NGO capital of the world. And mind you, what I'm saying is not just with Haiti. You look at countries in Africa and other lands, a lot of that is going on. It's just not hitting the press. So now it came out that um, Oxfam, Oxfam, the big scandal, you know, that they were using children to provide sexual activities for their for the, the for their people, for their staffers, when those money should have been used to feed the population, and they were lifting it up in hate. So I present that to you, and when people are rebelling against it, when people are marching, when people are demanding justice, we have a police force, and that's to tie it in with what you're talking about. The police in Haiti is created, is trained by the United Nations, and who says the UN says the United States. They have been created by them, trained by them, and they are among some of the most brutal police forces in the world. And so what we have is um, atrocities that are being committed. A lot of that is on video, is videotaped. And so the prisons in Haiti, they are managed again by the United Nations. I know many of you may feel, Pierre, this is just too much for us to handle. This is the reality. This is my chance to share that with you. Unless I do it, you won't see it on the New York, in the New York Times. You won't see it on CNN. You are not going to see it on ABC News because we've sent them the tapes of some of those massacres. I know. I've sent it to them. They have never published them. Whereas something else happened, uh, uh, someone else, the death of any person is horrible. But someone gets killed. One person gets killed in Iran. It's big time news and you have committees forming everywhere, as it should, as it should. But then you have hundreds of people being massacred in Haiti, scores of people being massacred. Does it make the news anyway? And what I'm talking about is not just for Haiti, it's for, it's for many countries that fit that. So there is a systematic dehumanization. And what happens is when a Haitian person comes in, after they are, they are forced to flee Haiti, then they get to be pointed out as freeloaders as someone, as the enemy. Then they mobilize people, or they are coming to take away your jobs. You know, They are coming to take away, uh, to, to be parasites on, on our system. And people know that immigrants pay, many of them pay into the system, and they don't get anything back for most of the time. They don't. So I'm talking about people, the undocumented. And so these are, these are the things that we need to look at and be in solidarity with the people. 
with our brothers and sisters from all over the world. And I want to say thank you so much for it, to each and every one of you, because after the earthquake, after the hurricanes, you all have been su very supportive of the people in Haiti. Unfortunately, many of the people in whom we placed our trust, donating millions of dollars to them, took the money, put it in their pocket, and those monies haven't reached the majority population in Haiti that still needs it. Thank you all so much. Everyone, thank you for being here. Thank you all, and uh, I'm glad to be part of this. I just want to touch a few things before I get into what I was originally going to say. Just everything you all say really brought a bunch of things to my head. I'm currently teaching a class in San Francisco State University called uh, Cuba, uh, Health, Education, and Culture. And it's interesting how we start talking about racism. That's our first topic, racism in Cuba. And we introduced this term called Orientalism, which was first introduced by Edward Said. And uh, we relate it to the term tropicalization, which is the idea of what the West sees other countries as. And what they found is that the West always sees other countries, other lands, as paradises. As lands where they could go and spend the rest of their lives. But when it comes to the inhabitants of these lands, they describe them as savages as dirty, as not capable of creating their own civilization, as not capable of uh, running their own government. Yeah, yeah. And the U.S. uses this no. excuse to keep intervening in these countries. These interventions lead to people becoming refugees. And then, how does the U.S. react to that crisis? I think uh, great governments, great people, are described and can be characterized by how they respond to crisis. I went to Cuba because they are a country that responds certain ways to crises. It is a country that provides free health care, free education for all its citizens. The first thing that I learned when I got there was, they asked me, what, how do you truly heal a person? And what they first taught us was that you need to see each human being as a biological, sociological, psychological, and spiritual human being. If you are able to heal all those aspects of every person, that's when you truly heal a person. So can a doctor truly heal a person? No. Not only a doctor, it takes political will, it takes teachers, it takes spiritual leaders, it takes community to truly heal a person. Right? Now, what I want to talk about is how Clinica Martin Baro deals with this issue of immigration. Have you all heard the term of social determinants of health? Yes. Okay, so we're asking this to our students. Please give us examples of social determinants of health. Everybody else have poverty, lack of housing, lack of education, um, social status. Nobody mentions immigration. You know? And when we start talking about it, people say, yeah, it, it affects your health because when you cross a border, you go through all this trauma. Immigration becomes a social determinant of health since before they actually leave their country. The reasons why we have immigration, all those reasons start becoming social determinants of health, and they will determine health outcomes in our communities. Clinica Martin Baro was started in 2007 and officially opened in 2007. But the idea of it, the dream of it, started way before that. And every plan starts with a dream, right? And you might think it's impossible to run a clinic having bake cells at San Francisco State, having movie cells, uh, movie nights. How can this provide free medication and free health services for a clinic? It goes to show that an alternative way of medicine, an alternative way of healthcare is possible. Why is our healthcare system the way it is right now? Because of our system. It's everything revolves around profits. So if people are making money off your symptoms, therefore they're making money off of your lives. Clínica Martín Baró has been struggling to create healthcare as a human right. And uh, in, our, in our waiting room, we don't sit like a typical waiting room. The room doesn't look like this necessarily. We sit in a circle. We found that people don't heal just by giving them Advil or any medication. 
a big part of healing, which was also part of Ignacio Martin's borough theory, is that they heal through dialect. When people are able to come together and listen to other people that are going through similar uh, stories as they have or have experienced similar experiences in the past, they start to heal without having to see the doctor. That's the kind of space we facilitate at Clinica Martin Baró. We are aware of the, that immigration is one of the biggest social determinants of health, so we try to approach that issue, not just by providing basic medical care. A big thing about it is that we don't believe in charity. Charity is you go and you give people something, right? The main reason why people do charity is because it makes you feel good inside. It makes you feel like you did something, right? And that might be helping people by putting band-aids in certain problems. We try to focus on raising what we, we call conscientización, raise consciousness in the people. We want to give them the tools to help themselves. Currently, there's the biggest factor affecting our community, I think, is fear. In the first uh, weeks of, of January, we only had, had four patients per Saturday. And uh, recently we had 11. And we asked them, what happened? Where were you all? Like, you know, we were scared to leave our homes. We have been hearing in the news all these ICE raids going on at San Francisco General Hospital. We imagined they were going to be here too. Clinica Martin Baró was one of the first organizations to create an escape plan in case there were ICE raids. Our volunteers are willing to be arrested before letting them take any of our patients. Um, we shared this at UCSF as well, and UCSF is now starting to develop a similar plan in case you, um, ICE raids start happening. So how do we deal with this whole thing of fear, right? And it's just so simple. The circle. The circle is, to me, is like a magical place. People come and share everything that, that has happened to them in their lives, everything that they're doing to, to help deal with that. And our volunteers are all culturally aware of what's going on. All our volunteers speak Spanish. They have had similar experiences as our patients. And uh, that, to me, I think has been the biggest difference beyond medications, beyond labs, beyond all of that. Um, when, when I got back from Cuba, a lot of people told me, you're a communist, you're a socialist, you're this, you're that, right? And it's not that. I think believing in providing free education, free health care, the right to pursue happiness, that to me is just being human. I like to call it humanism, right? And uh, what you were saying right now about the UN troops defecating in the river, the Cubans, when they hear of a crisis, they, were able, they had their own crisis with the hurricane, right? And they sent thousands and hundreds of doctors to all the Caribbean. They sent hundreds of doctors to Haiti to provide free medical health care, something that the government should be taking care of. And like I said, doctors are not there to just treat symptoms. What the Cubans did, they went and treated the water that had been defecated on by other people and were able to cure cholera in the, in the areas where were mostly affected just by that, just by testing the water and treating it. That to me tells me that to, be, to truly heal a whole population, you have to be human first and know what you're doing know who you're dealing with, you're dealing with other humans, right? You're not dealing with machines, you're not dealing with robots. And, uh, okay, so going back to immigration, right? Stress can be bad, right? But it can be good. What happens when we have chronic stress? Does fear cause chronic, chronic stress? Fear of not being able to leave your house, does that cro cause chronic stress? Does fear of being arrested, fear of not being able to go pick up your kids after school, does that cause chronic stress? Fear of not having enough to eat, fear of not having housing, that causes chronic stress, right? Now when you, people analyze health outcomes, a lot of times they do it by class, right? And all studies show that the lower class you're in, the worse health out outcomes you're going to have. When we look at it at race, and they compare uh, two families, a white family and an African American family, that make the same amount of money, live in the same neighborhood, the African American still has worse outcomes than the white family. Why is that? Stress due to racism. You could have a black doctor go into a store and still get followed. 
by the people that work there. This chronic persecution, chronic fear, chronic stress is leading our communities to be less healthier than any other communities. Immigration today in the Latino community, in all the communities that immigrate to this country are affected by this. Our health is affected by this. If we don't realize this, if we keep treating flus, if we keep treating diabetes with pills and not realizing that we need to go and prevent this from happening, our communities are never going to heal. And I feel that Clinica Martin Bono is trying to do that. And uh, that's all I have for today. So thank you all the panelists for being here and presenting on many different aspects related to the issues of immigration, detention, policing. Um, so now is the time for discussion. We open it up for questions any of you might have for all of the panel or a specific panelist. Um, we also have a few questions that we came up with ahead of time in case you're shy. But um, please, and if you ask a question, maybe you could stand up so they know who's talking and can pay attention. And introduce yourself. Sure. I wonder if you can talk more about worldwide solidarity. Did you guys hear worldwide solidarity? How do we do that? <laughs> I, when you say worldwide solidarity, I hear internationalism and I hear cross movement building. Um, I think in order to be in solidarity with people around the world, we have to show up with people right here in our own backyards who are from those parts of the world and ask them on their terms how to show up for those movements. I think there's a lot, especially in the Bay Area, we're very lucky to be able to have opportunities to engage with various communities and movements to show up around how we can show support for their movements on the ground here and around the world, um, but to also understand ourselves as part of a global community and to understand the issues here as global, whether it's policing or immigration, um, to understand that it is about freedom of movement, the freedom of people to stay, the freedom of people to return to their homeland. All of, if we make the connections and there are every single day in our, all of our work, then in it inherently we are showing up for the world and for each other and for the people all around us. Yeah, yeah I, I think I would say the same thing. I get asked that in my classroom a lot. And, uh, you know, as I kind of look at racism, and I use a, um, who actually taught here, a geographer, uh, uh, Ruthie Gilmore, who's a writer about prisons in the United States, and she has her definition that many of us use is, you know, what racism is, and I'm not going to go through her big, long, you know, three-line sentence work, but it is basically like those things, those structural, legal, ex extra-legal kind of things that lead to premature death. And when I teach my classes, although my classes are about race, it's like I break it down like, what is it that's killing us? What's it that's killing us? Some of us killed, get killed quicker, faster, with more intent than others, whether it be because of housing, your paycheck, the health, the health system, police, prisons, or whatever. Who are we? And how much closer are we to death? And why is it that we're closer to death than other folks? And then how do we kind of come together to go like, we're not going to die, we ain't going to die today. And then that being the kind of common denominator, which is exactly I think that, you know, we're talking about, like, what is it? And that, I mean, for me, that's racism, but it's also, it's obviously class and capitalism, well, racial capitalism. What is it that's killing us and who's trying to kill us? And let's fight them. And um, that was a perfect example you gave earlier about um, the earthquake and the hurricanes. Mm -hmm. You know, when Cuba sent all those doctors there, and it was really powerful. And that reminds me of um, also one of the results of that uh, Cuban solidarity with the Haitian people is the school, um, Relief a Medical School in Haiti. President Ali said had a dream of having a medical school that would serve because Haiti, it was, um, during the 80s, it was one doctor for every 20,000 people. One doctor for every 20,000. 
and and uh, and in some parts it was worse because this is the overall right but when you look at most of the doctors concentrated into the capital city so that made it worse so his dream was to have to 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 have more nurses and doctors and as such he founded the UNIFA, University of the IC Foundation, and discussed that with the Cuban government. They provided the support, and UNIFA was founded. But you know what? The coup d'etat took place in 2004. The first thing that the Marines did, and the special forces in the UN, was to shut down the medical school. They shut it down. Turning, turning it into barracks, army barracks. And Cuba sent a plane, took all those medical students, 230 of them, brought them to Cuba to finish their medical studies. Now many of them have returned to Haiti, and they are teaching at the reopened UNIFA, University of the Alcide Foundation, where President Alcide, this year will be the graduating class, the first graduating class of full fledged doctors from UNIFA. So I'm sharing that as an example of the practical solidarity of the poor, the people working with each other. So that, that's one aspect. The other aspect has been the many responses here in the Bay Area that we have seen from different people. Um, one of the things that struck me, so many things struck me, that's why I love the Bay Area was the response at the airport last week when there was this ban and people just, I, I thought I would see maybe 20, 50, 100 people. I said, man, I called my wife, I said, this is world the world people, you need to be here, where are you? It was amazing. And the same thing was occurring in different parts of the different cities, in New York, everywhere. I mean, nobody, it was instantaneous, from the heart. See, this is what, to me, is really key. And what helps is the sharing of information, providing each other with information about what's going on in our different lands. I was exposed to uh, global solidarity, I think, firsthand. I was part of that global solidarity. Who would think that Cuba would bring U.S. citizens to study medicine for free and send them back to study in underserved communities? That, to me, was unbelievable when, when I I mean, it was the best decision I ever made, I feel. And uh, when you talk about how they turned the medical school into barracks, Fidel did the opposite. He turned a naval base into an international <laughs> medical school. You know? and that's what I was saying about how people react to crises. I think that uh, for us to support uh, the solidarity movements, I think you need to support anything that's humanistic, anything that you feel is, is the best for humankind. For me, for example, I, do, uh, a lot of, I support a lot of Cuba and ending the blockade in Cuba because by us helping Cuba, we're helping the world. Everything Cuba has done for the world under this economic blockade, I can only imagine what else they could do without this economic blockade imposed on them. So that's just an example of little things that we can all do and, and look for those humanistic, uh, the humanistic work that people are doing. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. I've been to Cuba also, I spent a month there and after a month being there, I reinforced the fact why I'm a proud socialist, proud communist, totally anti-capitalist. We need system change big time. And uh, anyway, I've been hearing about farm workers being under attack. And uh, I spent time with them, and it's really tragic. But um, I'd like to know, you mentioned uh, that, you know, People want to say, say thing to do is to stay home. What are the best ways, other best ways to avoid ICE? The best ways to avoid being arrested? So we have a lot of uh, uh, phone numbers and uh, uh, things people can do to alert people where an ICE raid is taking place. In addition to that, we also have, I think I have it, I might take it out and show it, a little red card. I don't know if any of y'all have seen it. It's a little. 
I know your rights card in Spanish and in English that if any person is detained, undocumented or documented, uh, they can present this to the police officer and it explains their rights and it explains to them that they cannot be arrested. They don't have to speak to the police, for example. Another place to have safe places, uh, I want to use the example of Pinica. They know it's a safe place. They know they have people that will protect them no matter what, right? And uh, I don't know if you all have any more suggestions, but I think that's been really effective. The ice raid crisis line has been really helpful because people are aware and people are using it. And if people know that ice is here, let's say at 24th admission, people will avoid that area because of this hotline. There's a lot of, you know, so there's Mikra Watch and Aquadir, which are local websites you can go to to find out about those hotlines. I think the other thing we've been trying to do is really, really expose the, the interactions and relationships between different law enforcement. So people um, are often calling the hotline not because of ICE, it's because of DHS, Department of Homeland Security, or because local police, or because of different forms of law enforcement. And so for us to be aware of the interactions and relationships between all of them and create a culture in the Bay Area where we know we need to disengage and further people from the relationships and connections to law enforcement, to not rely so much on any law enforcement because all of them are collaborating, sharing information, and making it that much more um, that much easier to deport, to detain, and imprison, and criminalize our people in the Bay Area. Yeah, I mean, I, I would concur. I mean, I, I think there is always these kind of practices we take, like, to defend ourselves. But on the offense, I think starting to kind of resituate our understanding of what police and policing are, and how we rely on them, and how we use them, and how they've been utilized, I think is really the, ultimately the most important thing, right? Like the, I mean, I'm an abolitionist, but I'm also a police abolitionist. I don't believe in policing. And I believe in law enforcement on the ground. I believe that there's other ways to manage whatever we as a society need to kind of manage amongst ourselves. And so I think very much like just changing our relationship to police and kind of however, in whatever ways that we have to go about that in our day-to-day -day lives, I try to do it in my classroom, like resituate and have them have a different, for instance, a historical understanding of what police officers are, right? That they are part of a colonial project. It isn't about our public safety. So if we think about our public safety from day to day, it's actually we don't really need police. And so I very much agree, it's our relationship to police that we need to change from the, the way we even understand what it is. And lastly, just to say, I think um, the hotlines work, but it's often too late. So once ICE has picked up somebody, yeah. it's, all, it's on all of us as people in the Bay Area with privilege to show up and make sure that no one is able to be deported, that ICE offices are shut down, that we are disrupting business as usual. It really takes um, a large number of people to change the systems and, and the progress that they're making in terms of pushing their politics and their agenda, and us to get creative about ways of disrupting it. So I, first hand I saw was Bo, and then yours, and then I think yours, and yours, and yours. So Bo, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it quick. Uh, my name is Bo, I'm a third year in the Public Health and City Planning Program. And at first I had a question as to like, what do you mean by racial capitalism? And then the fellow panelists really demonstrate some amazing examples of how um, capitalism is benefit basically off of racism or how it functions necessarily from racism. So as a soon to be graduating person uh, that is going to be entering the marketplace and trying to find work and in many ways participating in the system of capitalism, like what are the ways that we can continue to try to dismantle uh, the machinery that's really making this go? <laughs> <laughs> So don't work for the UN, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Being engaged, I believe, in um, talking to each other, educating each other, or uh, being aware of the, and I'm just giving some general things here, uh, organizing relentlessly with, with your neighbors and uh, engaging in discussion. Because we are dealing with a system that's so sophisticated and very powerful in terms of the brainwashing, and I know that's a, that's a word that's overused, uh, in terms of the brainwashing, that it's, it will make you, in the words of Malcolm X, it will make you love your enemies and hate your friends, you know? And so we need to um, expose it constantly and be sure to share the information 
and so that we don't succumb to the to the lies of it. One of the things I am a union member, and one of the things the <laughs> former steward who filed the WU, our rule was simple. If the boss says it, it's a lie. <laughs> if the boss yeah. says it, it's a lie. What's no. good for the boss is not good yeah. for us. Here, right. Right. you go from that premise. Right. And so, as we are looking at, um, they have managed to successfully, when I say they, I mean the global elite, they have managed to successfully keep us separated using racism. Right. Right. Um, for example, I'll give you a quick example. Many people do not know, when I speak about Haiti, the Haitian Revolution, as an example, many people do not know that some troops, white, Polish troops, who Napoleon had sent to restore slavery in Haiti, when they saw, when they landed on the ground, and they saw what the conditions were, what Napoleon was trying to do, they defected from the French and joined with the Africans fighting against the French army. And their descendants are alive in Haiti today. You know? And many people do not know that. Many people do not know about the San Patricio Brigade, right? When during the invasion of Mexico, how many people, Irish, Irish, who switched sides and said, no, this is wrong. And if my Filipino comrades were here, they would talk about a lot of the, you know, I'm sure there are Filipinos here who know about how many people who, who uh, how many soldiers who went to the other side and said, this is wrong. But we are not talking about these examples of solidarity with each other. So, um, and they use that against us. So, information, each one teach one, educating each other. When we see as a labor, as a labor man, um, a, a labor fellow, when there is a picket line, I try not to cross it. I honor that picket line. Because when you stand up, an injury to one is an injury to all. When you stand up, I got to stand up with you. You know? And uh, so those are basic overall things that I, I like to share. And I would be remiss if I wouldn't point to the Hesperian Foundation as an example of solidarity. Esperian Foundation, they produce a lot of books in um, medical books, medical texts, and I know this is for our field, but it's part of it. And they have translated those books into the various languages, the various <coughs> dialects, uh, languages like Creole in Haiti. And I've taken some of those books to Haiti, where people at the very grassroots level, who have no access to doctors, can get those books, read them, discuss the information. There are many kinds, many aspects of solidarity and many ways that you can act on to make a difference. Oh. Uh, well, in terms of dismantlement, uh, yeah, and racial capitalism, like, were you asking what is it or what? Uh, no, that is really stuck with you when you're equating policing to racial capitalism. Oh, well, yeah, because it doesn't, doesn't, work, without, doesn't work without the ground soldiers, right? It doesn't capitalism, and all capitalism is racial capitalism. Like, you know, they're not separate. It doesn't, doesn't one doesn't exist without the other. It's, yeah, the policing, it's on the ground. It's what, it's, what, it's what keeps it managed, right, in order. And then introduce, I say what he says. <laughs> So I think you can I add to the so that it's like uh, we're very uh, influenced by what we read, but what we see. And just remember to always be critical of everything. Remember that most of our history books, even medical books, are based on this theory of orientalism and tropicalization. And that's what we learn, you know? And just always be critical of what you're reading, what you're seeing. And look at other alternatives, make your own conclusions. Is that okay if it's more of a comment than a question? Sure. Let me start off by saying, um, Dr. Vela, um, my name is Nikki. Um, I actually did a um, PhD master's studies on um, uh, health radicalism uh, and specifically around free clinics and the Berkeley Free Clinic. And so hearing, hearing about a newer clinic that is you know, trying to move outside the privatization and specifically radicalize uh, is, 
uh, very invigorating. So, um, uh, so my comment actually is in some ways a response. I, I was very interested to hear about this escape plan that you guys work. The clinic personnel have agreed that they will be arrested. Um, because I, I think the point that you made, Laura, that the stakes are higher. We, we have had the deporter in chief. We've had decades of intervention, but the stakes are higher. We've, you know, we've, under Trump, we've made a leap to an actual program of ethnic cleansing. And so um, I want to just put out there this idea. Um, we've been thinking, I'm sorry, I'm with Refuse Fascism, and we've been thinking a lot about this idea of um, having restaurants and not just not just the clinic workers and the restaurant workers, but actually having individuals, every time you walk into a cafe, you look around and say, okay, what am I going to do when ICE comes? Because you're right, those, uh, those hotline numbers, by the time you know somebody is being taken away, uh, by the time people can get there, they're already in detention. And so um, I wanted to throw out that idea. We're actually trying to build that idea. Um, and then also, I mean, I think that because of this leap, we're at a point where we do need to actually be flooding the detention centers and saying we're not going to take 1,500 people uh, in these raids that they're planning or the other raids that they're doing. So I just wanted to, I don't know if you guys have any comments on that, but I actually think that um, we all need to be acting commensurate with the threat. I think that your model is one that should be spread. Oh, and I'm sorry, I just made an announcement. Six o'clock tomorrow night in Oakland Awaken Cafe, and we're actually getting together to talk about um, planning a massive protest at ICE at the beginning of, of March, as well as building these things and, and trying to make it go viral. So, thanks. So I do have a question. Uh, there was a group uh, that organized a presence uh, at 630 Montgomery Street in San Francisco the week of February the 8th. Uh, I want to know, first of all, is that still going on? And number two, uh, what can that presence hope to achieve? Anybody know about that? Yeah, but those are still happening. Um, and there's, oh. So what, what times and what days? You can text RESIST to 41411, um, and you'll get on a text loop system where you'll get alerts about upcoming actions and activities around ICE raids, but also any kind of attack on any community in this moment. And so. if you don't text. <laughs> 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 um, you can go. <laughs> You can go to Bay Resistance, do you have to go to online? You can go to bayresistance.org and then sign up to the online also email list. Thank you. Fair question. So the they need part, part, B, <laughs> part B is what can it hope to accomplish? Showing up at these buildings? Yes. I mean, is this an effective tactic? That's the question. I have an answer. <coughs> yes. We try, we are part of the organizing of that at ICE, and um, the answer is, it's like the outpouring at the airport that you were talking about. It's just everybody going down there and going, no, no, not on my watch, I'm not allowing this, and the more people and the more friends and the more connections and stuff that you have, that you keep showing up there with signs, no ban, no wall, you know, etc. I think it makes a statement, and you have a captive audience of all that traffic and people and etc. I don't know. The answer to can we stop ICE from driving their trucks out of there? Well, we actually some did, people that were did actually cross it. Well, you can stop. You can yeah. stop ICE. For, you know, you can you know, stop ICE from stopping you, from stopping your conscience. Yes, that seems to me is the objective. So excuse me. I'm, I've been going. I've been going to those demonstrations at the ICE headquarters, <coughs> and uh, we're trying to get people to come every day. Uh, I've been going about twice a week, but it, we sometimes we have 50 or 100 people, and sometimes we only have about five or ten. But in other words, it's so important because passerbys, the employees, uh, people driving by, uh, you got to do something, and and, and there, that's that's where it starts with that that building and and with those trucks coming in and out of there with people. Right. 
Yeah. You were next. So I wanted to comment on Pierre's um, notable bringing up of the Philippines in our 420, 425 years of colonial oppression. Um, and in building this, you know, the sociological wall, um, overseas Filipino workers are economic migrants that are exploited for their labor, which in turn create absentee parents from these vulnerable children. Developed countries like the United States, Philippines, Australia, and Canada take part in this subjugation of colonialized, uh, col colonized bodies and take advantage of their economic vulnerabilities. And often, when they arrive here, they get little to no civil or human rights. Um, I wanted to ask your perspective in um, creating solidarity and how to best stand with that. With the Filipinos? With the Filipino overseas workers. Yes. Um, one of the things that, that someone mentioned yesterday, I was in a meeting um, well, on Sunday, and he said something that reminded me of, of, um, of how to be human, you know? And what he said was, learn about each other's history. Learn about each other's culture. Teach the other one about your culture and your history. And you start breaking down the walls. You start the communication. And it was something I, you know, I, um, as a steward, when I was with the ILWU, there were many Filipino sisters and brothers on the job. And one of them, we were talking about Filipino history. And I, and I read El Filibusterismo in Nolino Tangeri, and read a little bit more about Filipino history. And we were able to, man, you should have seen, magically the walls were breaking down. And we, were, we had discussion in the lunchroom. They learned about Duvalier and our oppression. We were teaching them. And they taught me about McCoy, Marcos, you know, and we were celebrating when Marcos fled and Baby Dog fled. So it was like there was this, it was this commonality of our history. And uh, this is just a little anecdote of that. So when the brother said that, and I'll use his name, Clarence Thomas, he's a legendary union leader in the Bay Area. And when he said that, he reminded me of that. He was giving that advice and said, this is how we build solidarity, learning about each other's culture, each other's history, sharing that our stories with each other. That starts breaking things down and we start establishing common ground. And it's like, oh, you too, huh? The police is doing that to your family. Well, they do that to us too over there in Haiti. Uh, you too, you are being exploited, you know? Those companies leave the U.S., they tell you they are co coming to make your land a Shangri-La, and we find out they are paying us two cents or 20 cents an hour. And, uh, you know, and they are exploiting the workers here. Because, you see, that's another thing. It creates division. A worker here will say, well, they are exporting our jobs to Mexico. They are exporting our jobs to Haiti. Those people are stealing our jobs. But then when they find out, and those people there are rising up against those companies because they're exploiting them. So both people are being hurt by these guys who are, by these pirates who are taking advantage of them. Then we start talking about how can we unite to cross borders to challenge, to overturn this system, this global system that is hurting us well, here and also over there and creating confusion so that we don't communicate with each other. So, I'm sorry for going on. Yeah, I would, I would add something. Um, you know, part of the problem in the United States is we are conditioned to think that we should only be thinking about the United States as if everything is a domestic issue. And even till this day, and I won't name names, but there have been demonstrations in the Bay Area against ICE where AROC, because we're an internationalist organization, has been told to come and speak but not mention anything international. Don't bring up international issues. And I would challenge everybody um, to really hone in on what that means in this moment when we're not taking into account U.S. imperialism, when we talk about ICE or forced migration or immigration, however you want to look at it. Ultimately, we have to be also talking about international issues, whether it's the Philippines or North Korea or Palestine or understanding what's happening in Haiti or even in Syria and Yemen as directly um, you know, a part and parcel of U.S. imperialism. 
So also going back to your question around world solidarity, international solidarity, it's by being in the belly of the beast and naming it for what it is. It's what is the role of the United States in creating the devastation across the world that forces us to be here and beg, beg for breadcrumbs to even stay here through TPS mm -hmm. instead of actually addressing the root causes <coughs> of these issues and also mentioning them everywhere and every time we're challenging anything because we're doing a disservice to the people that are forced to be here, that are in detention centers, the people at the receiving end of war and imperialism, if we don't mention it every time we show up in the streets um, in this moment. That's right. Yes. 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 Now I can remember that there was the last half of your question that I really wanted to answer, and I can't remember what it was because it was mostly. Do you want me to repeat? Colleagues here, um, but but then I had this thought. Okay. Um, but I think in some ways we're all kind of saying it. I mean, I think to understand what our ask is, right? Like, what is the ask? Um, uh, you know. Um, what was it, 1943, 42? I, I, I don't know the exact date, but at some point, um, Du Bois was asked by the, the, um, the initial UN Commission for Human Rights to kind of jump on board, right? Like, be part of this, that has this whole history of how the, the UN Human Rights Commission kind of emerged in the 1940s. And Du Bois was like, no, man, I ain't, I ain't down with that. I ain't in on that. Like, he already saw that the idea of human rights, as it was proposed by the UN, was never going to be inclusive of what he saw as the racial subject of the United States, right, which is African Americans. Um, and so, so there was two things I was trying to say, and again, I think that we were kind of saying this up front, is like, what is the ask for? You know, is it simply, and I opened, I opened up, is it simply like, can I be, you know, it, are we simply dealing with immigration? I don't think we're dealing with just immigration. You can give us our citizenship. My family's been here six generations. A, a significant portion of the males in my family have all been imprisoned in jails in, across a citizen or not, right? Because they're Mexican origin people, because they have a history of war with this country, much like many other countries that we're talking about here on the board, what you're talking about, right? The racial subject comes out of things that exist outside of like the liberal ask for something like citizenship or even human rights, for instance, right? I mean, you cover that. Like, what does the UN mean? What is human rights in when it is exists in these kind of organizations that are either funded by who knows what, et cetera, et cetera right? That the racial subject, the subject, and, and what I find like finally refreshing, oh my God, I'm so glad that I'm not on one of my usual panels. Like, everybody's here answer was kind of on the ground. I didn't hear one person even though we've all alluded to it, going, well, we need the legal apparatuses or the NGOs to kind of give us our answers. Uh -huh. Everybody here, one way or the other, was saying, man, it happens on the ground. And so <clears throat> this is only to say, I think it, it's kind of, again, to get back like the origins of like the kind of problem that we're in, which is this enormous security apparatus. It's this, the, the biggest security <coughs> apparatus in the history of the world that exists in so many forms, whether it's ICE, or LAPD, or the Alameda Sheriff's Office. Oh my God, the stuff that you said about the Sheriff's Office, holy crap, right? Like, it is all one in the same. And, and, and the idea of human rights, as it exists in, or, like, or, in this organized way that human rights has its history embedded in the UN's idea of human rights, or the idea of like even immigration rights, which I believe is completely important. Like, do not get me wrong. I believe you to have your papers does give you protection. But my family, again, or African Americans, we've been here as citizens forever, and the cops will still kill us every <coughs> single day. Every single day they will kill us. Didn't matter if my family was here five generations, we still didn't get into college, and we're still in prisons and jails. Every single day. So the liberal ask for like the law to protect us, and provide us, and give us the racial subjects, the neo-colonial subjects, well, however you want to define it, isn't the solution. But again, I haven't heard one of my panelists, and again, I'm like, of these people. That's not what they're that's not the move. It's not the move that we're making. You know, we're not we're not going for that ask. Give it to us. Please make us proper citizen subjects. Because because again, we could get it, and I'm all for it, because I understand what that means when you're outside of it. But as the racial subject of like the colonial modernity pro what the, the the big road is there. They're always trying to kill us. You know what I mean? When we get in the way of capitalism, when we get in the way of uh, uh, um, not acquiring the ones, accumulation, right? It doesn't matter. They'll get us. They're coming for us. They got the guns.
guns, we don't. They got the law on their side, we don't. And they got the money. I mean, I hate to put it that crudely, but it's, and they got the law, or the liberal ideas of law as this thing that's gonna protect us. I mean, I should be protected. I'm a citizen, my family. My family's been here sixth generation, there's Mexican origin people. It didn't keep my family safe. A little more safe, but mostly not. So, somehow that had to do with it, and then everything like this. Just quick example. Um, I mean, this bunk bed, because in our rooms we were with bunk beds, and the person sleeping on top of me from day became my best friend, he's from Western Sahara. A lot of us in our room didn't even know Western Sahara was a country. You know, a lot of us thought it's a desert, but no, it's an occupied territory by uh, Morocco. And uh, he told me, you are from the U.S. You, it is your responsibility to take my story and take it to the U.S. so that everybody in the U.S. can know what my people are going through, you know, and I take that seriously. And that's another way of being in solidarity with people overseas. I think we have time for one more, and I remember one other hand was you. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Seth. I'm a uh, union member of SCIU Local Pension One, and I like the leader. Um, <laughs> I would uh, uh, just kind of pose the question about um, the militarization, um, you know, or confronting militarization. That's what caught my attention and why I you know, took the time to come out uh, today to check this out and hear more about it. Because uh, when I was a student and a student organizer in the early, early O's, the mid O's, we were dealing with this head on, especially after 9-11 and the wars and invasions that happened. Um, but we had things like, you know, kicking off uh, military recruiters off of campus, right? Not just because we thought the military was doing something wrong, but because we saw the connection of that to uh, taking away our education, our public education opportunities, and, you know, keeping youth from the ability to have alternatives to joining the military, right? Um, I feel like that's somewhat been lost, right? And then the other piece that's really blown my mind lately uh, in terms of like how do we challenge demilitarization, just look at you know the deal that they're trying to come up with on DACA and, and those folks where you know I, I don't know anybody who's on DACA who's in favor of building a wall and militarizing any further, but that's a deal that some people are willing to cut, apparently, right? It's like, how do we get to the part where like, we're, we're ready to concede to further militarization in order for a little bit you know, significant, but just to get to something, right? Like, where, is, where does that come from? You know, and I work in the labor union where just getting people out to the Operation Shield you know, event you know, was tough because it's not something that people directly, you know, you have no position of things right in. Yes, we know if all that money wasn't spent on that, you could go to better places in our community to get that, but we feel like five to 20 steps removed from getting that to happen, right? So while that's cooking, we're figuring out other things, and I'm learning a lot from all four of you, what are some ideas to like for, further politically and culturally move the idea of demilitarizing and challenging militarization with folks who are not in the room? Okay, can I say something? Because I need to say something so badly for the militarization of the police. Militarization, I mean, you know, it can be traced in a bunch of different ways. I think the most kind of obvious, like in the uh, book City of Ports, Mike Davis talks about how a young Daryl Gates, before he becomes the chief of LAPD, kind of first came up with this idea, oh, there's this leftover kind of armament from the Vietnam War. Let's bring it into Los Angeles on the heels of the Watts riots, right? On the heels of the rebellions that hit the streets where, you know, African Americans in LA were like, no more, we're done. They took court to the street and were like, no, screw this. Daryl Gates' response was like bringing real military army. And the second thing, um, you know, looking at the police historically in this country as well as in other countries. I understand the issue about like the militarization, meaning bringing in tanks and helicopters. But they killed Eric Garner with their hands. Like, let us not forget the police killed him with their bare hands. Meaning, and all that is to say is that the police have the impunity to kill, whether it be with a tank, a helicopter, a semi-automatic weapon, or their hands. So what I mean by that is the root of the problem is in policing. The militarization of it, okay. Is it a problem? Sure. 
but they killed Eric Garner with their hands. And it is at the root of policing and their ability to kill with impunity. And I mean all cops. I mean soldiers and cops. I mean soldier cops. I mean, I mean in that way. The impunity to kill with what, what is, stands behind you is the state's need to preserve itself or the sovereignty or protect the sovereignty of whatever, na hence sovereignty nation capital, they have the right to kill. So that's all I have to say about the militarization of police. Again, I know it's a problem, but they can kill with their hands and get away with it, and it's okay. So I'm Going back to what racism does to people, and uh, there's many people on the border who are civilians as well, killing immigrants coming here, and they see that as an act of patriotism. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, for that, that's just because they think it's racism. Thank you everyone for asking great questions. Thank you to the panelists for bringing up a lot of different things. So we have two more sessions next month. Um, there's one on building solidarity across difference for racial justice. And then um, in April, there's a panel about Latin American social medicine and bringing concepts and practices from Latin American social medicine here. Um, so check out bcsm.berkeley.edu or the California Nurses Association or National Nurses United Facebook page for more information and get refreshments. Thanks.